Good morning to you all. A joy to be with you. I'm speaking this morning about entering into the expectation of Mary. How to live Mary's attitude, her Advent attitude. This is going to be a little bit deep, so buckle up, okay? But um, there's a lot of depth. I don't expect, I, I myself find this deeply mysterious and rich. I'm going to keep an eye on the time, not to go over 30 minutes, so. But um, what a wonderful gift to enter into the experience of Mary, into her expectation. I just had some coffee, so I think I'm going to take this off. That doesn't have anything to do with the talk, don't worry. All right, dear sisters in Christ. I'll start with a reflection from St. Augustine, who tells us that Mary conceived first in her spirit before she conceived in her body. So the Blessed Mother, the Virgin, was always open to God's plans. She was always a, a receptacle of the grace of God, made fruitful by the grace of God, conceiving first in her spirit before the incarnation and conceiving of God himself in her body. What an amazing gift. God himself wants to join himself in that tiny dependent way to a human being who's nothing but a human being. What an amazing God. So the total ascent of the Virgin, so that the Mary's complete ascent was prepared by her immaculate conception. God, from the moment of her conception in her mama's womb, preserved her from original sin so that she could give a complete yes, an absolutely full yes without reservation. Original sin keeps you and me in a hesitation mode where we're not sure to, if we want to totally surrender ourselves, if we want to give ourselves so completely. So she was able to give her complete yes, thanks to the Immaculate Conception, the great grace of God, which only gives redounds to God's glory, what he did to prepare her for this yes on behalf of all mankind. She said yes for you and me. Good job, Mary. Thank you for doing that for us. And so that becomes, that yes of hers becomes the child's spiritual womb. I said she conceived in spirit first, right? The spiritual womb for God Almighty is her yes, her complete yes. And only then does her body become a physical bearing womb. From the, from the moment the angel speaks to her, her expectation becomes different. She goes from Old Testament to New Testament expectation. So before, and as, a, as a woman of the Old Testament, a good Jewish woman of the Old Testament, she's waiting for the Messiah. Everybody's waiting for the Messiah. Everybody's getting married to help bring about the Messiah. That's why it was considered a curse not to have lots of children or to be sterile, because you're not helping bringing about the Messiah. Why are you not letting me help bring about the Messiah, Lord? And so we know so many stories from the Old Testament here in this regard. So she's waiting for the coming of the Messiah, and she's adoring God uh, outside of her. But from the moment of the incarnation forward, she begins to adore God within. <laughs> God who's now become incarnate, who's joined humanity to himself. While always remaining the Son of God in heaven, it's not like God left heaven. There are only two persons in heaven now, and one was down here on earth. The Son always remains with the Father and the Spirit, but he joins to himself humanity here below. And God becomes one with us. God with us, Emmanuel. When she spoke her ascent, she was a representative of you and me, and she prepares a place for the coming of God. And she prepares herself to be the vessel of the incarnation. So the, the fullness now upon the incarnation is within her, the word of God growing in her. 
and her expectation now forms itself according to this growth and grows with it. Her, <clears throat> her expectation will now be born out of fulfillment. So because the Lord has now become one with her, as she adores God within, so amazing, huh? as she adores God within, the expectation of the world is now within her. The expectation of the world is now within her. And so what is within her becomes a function of this fulfillment. Through the fulfillment of the promise in her, her expectation comes about. The mystery of Advent is something that Mary will pass on to the church as a permanent state. This expectation, too, is primarily a spiritual and only secondarily a physical expectation. And so she's teaching us that you and I are to custode, to protect the word of God within us. In other words, all of us, male and female, are called to bear the sun within us. We're called to open up ourselves and give a complete yes to God's plans in our lives and let his expectation become ours. Instead of Father Anthony having hopes and expectations for what God will do in the world that come from Father Anthony, okay, that's not a bad thing, I'm not, but we need to go deeper than that. We need to receive God's expectations, God's hopes for the world. And so how is the sun living within me? How do you welcome the word of God within you? How do I do that too? In front, of, in front of God, we're all receptacles of grace. God is always taking the active part. How do I allow God to, to have a space within my womb and to grow from within me? And all of my body and all of my soul, I want to custode and nourish this word of God within me. What is the word of God speaking to me? And how am I allowing it to grow within me and letting that form my expectations. So in other words, my expectations, my hopes become those of God. What are God's hopes for our world today? What are God's hopes in the midst of COVID? What are God's hopes in the midst of so many children, grandchildren falling away from the church? What are God's hopes? And conforming mine to his, Mary does that well. So when she says, be it done to me, the fiat, great name for this wonderful group, she puts herself as woman at disposal, at the disposal of the active shaping word of God within her. She allows herself to be shaped by the child within her. Not unlike if you've been pregnant, notice how your body has different cravings now because there are two of you. <laughs> And so you allow yourself, your, the way you eat, the way you do a lot of things, changes according to the child within. And you do extra things and you take extra nourishment, perhaps you, you accommodate whatever the needs of the child within you are. And so too, uh, that, that remains very true spiritually. She has this spirit of what you can call active receptivity, probably the best way to understand the Blessed Mother and her expectation is active receptivity. That's what you and I are called to, active receptivity. So primarily, it's a receptivity to what God wants to do in my life. I'm, I'm receptive to that, but actively so. I'm not a bump on a log kind of, okay, Lord, do something, you know, do something, you're awesome, I'm nothing. Um, it's not like that. It's an active receptivity. So the Lord wants to form me. I'm called to this spirit of what Ignatius will call holy indifference. And holy indifference means that like soft clay, I can be molded into any kind of vessel the Lord wishes. Any kind of vessel of grace the Lord wishes. And do I remain soft and pliable or does he harden me? The answer is I remain soft and pliable. <laughs> I remain soft and pliable. And so by grace, that's why I go to confession when I notice a nodule and Father Anthony has to have things done his way, right? I need to confess that. I have my ways of dealing with reality that are a little bit hardened. I have expectations of others. I have expectations of myself. 
have expectations of what God should be doing. I don't know why he's not doing more of this. And so these are the things I need to confess. I need to have those softened again so that my whole self is pliable, moldable, like good clay. Jeremiah's image. Okay? So active receptivity. So I'm responding to the word of God. Sometimes we have the image of Mary being like this clear, perfect. Some saints use her use this image of a perfect steel tube. It's like perfectly clear and spotless. And so it's a conduit of God's grace perfectly. Nothing gets messed up from God's grace. That's a good image, but only to a point. The problem with that image is there's no activity of a tube. If I'm a steel tube, even perfectly clean steel tube, um, then, then there's no, uh, it, there's no um, activity on my part. There's no assent on my part. But Mary, of course, is constantly assenting to God's plan in her life, constantly saying yes throughout her life. Uh, do not think that her yes was at the beginning of her life when she kind of followed through with the consequences. It was a constant yes, and God kept expanding her yes and asking more and more of her to the point on the cross where he says, would you give me up and take John and all Christians, disciples, in his name as your son and your daughter instead of me? <laughs> wow, the ultimate act, the ultimate ask. And she says, fiat. <laughs> Active receptivity, what a wonderful way to understand her. So her love for the child grows with the child himself. And it is not only the human motherly love that increases, it is also the love of the Lord in her, which makes her more capable of loving. Isn't that beautiful? So it's not just that she, being a good mother, like cherishes the womb, uh, the child within her womb, but she allows the love of God himself within her to form her love so that she's loving according with God's love. It's a beautiful image, dear sisters, because if Father Anthony tries to love with the love that he has as trying to be a good priest, a good Jesuit or whatnot, it's limited. But I can love you with divine love if I receive it as a gift. When Jesus says, love one another as I have loved you, we should say back to Jesus, that's impossible. <laughs> because you're God and you're loving with divine love. It's too much to ask. It is too much to ask, unless we allow God's love to love through us, as does the Blessed Mother. So she's receiving the fullness of love from within her. Does that make sense? She's receiving the fullness of love and loving with divine love because divine is, the divine son is within her and giving her a love that just like oozes out of her pores. Everything about her is received from here so there's an active movement from the sun through her to loving everyone around her. It would have been so amazing to, to be in her company during her pregnancy and beyond. Wow, that's going to be an awesome part of the next life. Pray God. Something else about this expectation that we're entering into. It's a precursor to something. The expectation is a preparation for suffering. At first, nothing of the passion is visible. And all that we can recognize here is the endurance, which is part of every pregnancy, enduring the, the, the sickness, the morning sickness, whatever she went through, enduring the awkwardness of carrying an extra child within me, and I kind of waddle now instead of walk or whatever as the child gets bigger, enduring um, everything that goes with pregnancy. You all know much more than I about that. But there's the natural endurance there, which lies in every pregnancy. But there's something more here. The conception by the Spirit was already endurance, and it increases in the expectation of birth. Okay, so just like a mother realizes we're getting close to the birth, this is going to be excruciating. Uh, there's going to be a cross in your ex cruz, right? There's going to be a cross involved here in the giving of the birth. It will increase in the birth itself. And this letting it be done to her becomes a direct preparation for the way of the cross. St. Ignatius will ponder the, will ponder the, uh, the Christ child laid in the manger, the Christ child being born in Bethlehem in the stable, as a preparation for the cross. Already he's born in, in poverty and cold and among animals and um, laid in a manger 
at the beginning of his life and he'll be laid in a manger at the end of his life, wrapped in swaddling clothes once again. It's all a preparation. You see here there's some prefigurement of the suffering that this child, as Archbishop Sheen says, is the one child in the history of the world who's come to die. This child has come to die. And Mary recognizes that. It's been prefigured by Simeon. So there's a preparation for the way of the cross here. And yet Mary doesn't just put up with that notion of the suffering of her child. She accepts it with her whole soul. So you and I are called to be a holocaust, giving ourselves, our very bodies and souls, as a holocaust for the salvation of the world, as a sacrifice, a holy sacrifice. So she, has a, she surrenders herself to that fact that this child, I have to give up, I have to constantly allow it to separate from myself. I have to pull the child, allow the child to be swaddled, pulled away from my breast, my nourishing breast, and placed in the manger uh, there for others to adore, including grubby shepherds with dirty hands that haven't used sanitizer yet, um, including everything. You get the idea, huh? Animals around there, imagine the manure smells around her child. A mother has a natural nesting instinct. Um, try nesting in a cave. <laughs> that would be hard. But so she does. She accepts what God gives her and knows she needs to surrender what is most precious to her. Isn't that hard as a mother to surrender what's most precious to you, especially your children, to keep surrendering them on the altar, especially when they are struggling, going wayward in some way, to keep surrendering them on the altar each time that they come up on your heart to re-surrender them, which is the greatest gift, the greatest prayer you can make for them. She's ready to give her son to mankind. Even as an expectant mother, she was perpetually giving him away. There is in her life no season that is simply one of expectation and then goes over into the state of having been born to make room lastly for the period of the way of the cross. Rather, the mother gives the son in uninterruptedly to the world and to the father. She's constantly surrendering her child. This the Jewish people understood well. The time of the presentation, that child belongs, that child born of the womb, especially the firstborn male, is going to be raised by the temple priests, not your child, not your child. The only way you can redeem the child is to allow some other animal to be sacrificed in its stead. A bull, heifer, goat, or if you're really poor, two pigeons. <laughs> and those animals have to be sacrificed so that you can raise that child as a gift, but you remember that that's not your child. That's hard for us, isn't it? Not to think, these are my children. These are my children. Uh, how many children do you have? Uh, people ask us those questions. And we have to always keep in mind this Marian attitude of, these are not my children, they're God's children. My spouse and I had a marital act that we named nine months later. But these are really God's children. And so I'm constantly resurrendering them on the altar, on the altar of sacrifice. She gives her son over again and again. This is hard, uh, especially if you've lost a child or I was talking recently with a dear friend who lost a child. And it's hard to remind ourselves that, that this child always was God and uh, always belonged to God. And so for instance, in a miscarriage, uh, that, that the pain of the miscarriage is an invitation, it's a reminder that that child always was God's, fulfilling his or her mission from a, from a very young age. And I was never, I can never grasp onto that child. It's so tempting to grasp. It's almost like our natural reaction is to, to make a fist and to hold on to something as opposed to let go. But the invitation is, of course, to let go, even though it's so easy to hold on tight like this. She never regards herself as owner of the son, but always knows herself to be standing in the service of a duty which far surpasses her. As mother, now here's the Trinitarian dynamic. As mother of the eternal son, she discovers that the eternal father is eternally taking from her the son whom he eternally gives her. And in receiving the son back from her, he gives her at the same time his ever greater presence. 
There's a dynamic there of a constant surrender as the mother's praying over the son within her. This is your son, Heavenly Father. She develops this profound intimacy with the Heavenly Father. This is your son growing within me that I am custodian. Never does become my son. This is your son sent for the salvation of the world. She knows what's going on within her. I, I don't, it's a sweet song in one way, the sound of it, but the theology is not so good. Mary, did you know? <laughs> you know, all that is like, the answer is yes, yes, and yes. <laughs> she knew. Um, so she knew that this babe born within her would be the savior of the nations. Uh, it was foretold, angel told her directly. She had pondered this. And yet she knows it's not her son. Huh? This, is, this is the son of God born within her. She's not, she did not conceive by natural means, we know. And so she's constantly surrendering that son over, overcoming that tendency to cling to her child, surrendering him back over to the father, back to surrendering the, the, the father's son back to him, and then receiving evermore this gift that remains pure gift within her, that grows from within her, that eventually is born forth. And as he's born forth, he's constantly, she constantly offers him back to the Lord as gift. You and I are given this grace of faith. We're given what is the sun within us? What is the word of God doing within us? How do you and I take care of the word of God? And how do we appreciate that word as pure gift? Taking care of that word, I want all of my, my bodily, my spiritual senses to guard and to protect and to share this word of God growing within me. How does the word of God make me pregnant? How does the word of God make me fertile? How do I share this fertility with others? How do I share the word of God with others and recognize it's not my word? It's a, it's a, it's something I've, it's a, it's a word of God that I, it's an inspiration, this Advent, that I'm sharing with others. It's a reflectiveness. Um, as difficult as it is to keep focused during Advent when there's so many things coming at us, it's so important because the Lord is speaking a few words to us and we need to custode what those words are. What, how is the Lord speaking to me? And share those words with others because they belong for the redemption of the world. They belong to others. So Mary is drawn out of a simple personal intimacy between herself and the child and into the depths of the mysteries between the father and the son. I'm gonna share with you how not to do this, okay? I have a dear friend who lives in a faraway state and she said she didn't understand this at all and so she said, I could go to mass with my beautiful little boy and she said, I could spend the whole mass, I thought it was a virtue, I could spend the whole entire mass looking at my boy and how sweet he was and how beautiful he was and how attractive he was and how, and I thought that was kind of amazing how I could spend the entire mass looking at my child. And so it was all about her and her child and there was no third party. And so she would never look at the priest, she would never look at the sacrifice, she would never surrender her child because it was her child. That's how not. <laughs> to enter into a relationship with your child. There's no third party there. There's no life and fruit there. Is there someone in your life, maybe not your direct child, but someone who's your spiritual child that you kind of cling to, and that's your child? I don't surrender that child. I don't surrender that child on the, on the altar. Who's your child? Could be a parent of yours. I don't care what the age is. Huh? someone you're concerned about. Is that your, is that your initiative? Is it your person that you're taking care of? Or are you regularly surrendering God's child back to God? Is there a way in which I'm becoming possessive of somebody? And it could be somebody in, in need, an inconsiderable need. Entering into the expectation of Mary is this surrender of those most precious to me. Surrender of them back to the Lord, receiving them back on my heart. There's a dynamic going on here. And Mary enters into it. Of receiving this gift from the Father, giving this gift back to the Father. She enters into the Trinitarian dynamic. The Father is all about his Son. And he loves him in this complete spirit of love. And the Son is all about the Father. Giving himself back to the Father. And Mary 
is the receptacle of this giving and enters into that spirit of giving. Kind of deep, huh? <laughs> I can't say that I understand that, but I get the sense of it, huh? And, and that, that call to, to not hold on, you know, if I have a sick relative or if my mama becomes sick or something, to not hold on and to get the Lord to do what I want the Lord to do for her, but to keep surrendering her, not my will, but thine be done. That's how every prayer should be. There should be the spirit of that in every one of my prayers. And yet Father Anthony has this tendency to say, Lord, please come to my will. <laughs> and I forget the last part. <laughs> And I keep begging the Lord, and I'll try different prayer practices to get the Lord to come to my will, because I really think my will's good. <laughs> and there may not, it may not be wrong as such, but it's not whole, because I'm not surrendering. In her Advent, Mary participates in advance in the spiritual birth pangs suffered by her son on the cross in such a way that she thereby assumes her role, her feminine role, as co-redemptrix. So she's helping bring about the redemption of the world by this surrender. And she's going to have to surrender her son from the very beginning, from the very moment of her conception, wanting to share him. Yesterday we had the, her running, taking off 90 miles by foot to go help out her. No, that's coming. I'm sorry, I just wrote a meditation for it. I'm so confused. It's coming up this Sunday. <laughs> Um, the visitation. And so she takes off for 90 miles to go see her elderly relative miraculously con who has miraculously conceived. So she's sharing Jesus right away and sanctifies John the Baptist thereby. We call that his baptism. She's giving away her son constantly to the point where she's practiced at it and she gives him away one last time on the cross to receive him back anew resurrected. She's standing at the foot of the cross, St. John says. She doesn't cling to him. Uh, Michelangelo properly depicts her giving away her son one last time, receiving his dead body on her lap and allowing him to do this one last act, which is the descent into hell, to preach to the souls in prison, St. Peter says, this total self-gift. And anyone willing to enter into that self-gift can be redeemed with him. She doesn't cling to him. Giotto is wonderful, has wonderful frescoes, but he has just a natural Mary, like clinging to Jesus in uncontrollable sorrow and just weeping profusely and just clinging to his body as he's taken down from the cross, which would be a natural reaction. But Mary didn't just act with the natural. She acted with the supernatural. I think Michelangelo got that right. There's a, there's a letting go of Jesus's body one last time into the sleep of death, so as to rise again as he had promised. All right. She was appointed to her motherhood in order to give the father back this son as incarnate. And there's something that the son will learn from her, this, this surrendering action of giving oneself back to God. That's what we're doing here at the seminary. We're trying to help these men discern how they can best give themselves back to God, to receive themselves as gift and to give themselves back as gift. That is so uncommon in our world today. I'm working with a young man who's considering religious life seriously, but as I probed in there, I could see that it was very much about him choosing what he thought he could do with his gifts that would be fulfilling for him. Do you catch a common denominator in there? <laughs> and I'm like, I think I need to help you learn to listen, you know, in prayer. You need some profound listening skills to hear what God, we want to conform our desires to God's desires. What your children want to do with their life, I don't have a lot of interest in, what, they, what does God's desires are for them, there I have lots of interest. <laughs> and if there are men here who realize at a certain point that God's desires are not to be in the seminary, we happily let them move on. Huh? 
But it's listening to God's desires. Entering into that expectation is a very, very much a listening process. Mary gives Jesus at Christmas both to the world and to the Father. This is really beautiful. She gives him to the world created by God that it may be redeemed. She knows that her sons come to die. Lots of precursors. Remember Simeon early on. We'll let her know 40 days after the birth. Ah, then they're off into Egypt because her son's about to be killed. Bonaventure and Aquinas say it's seven years in Egypt. Can you imagine taking a newborn child and taking off into a foreign land for seven years? I mean, again, you have a natural motherly good nesting instinct. And if I invite you to head off to Iraq for seven years and go nest there, it's like, oh, goodness, Lord, what are you doing? So she knows that her son is made to be given over to humanity hmm? for the redemption of the world. And there's a double gift, both to the world and back to the Father. She gives him back to the Father that he may redeem the world. <laughs> this is your son meant to be the one who will redeem the world and draw it back into its proper ordering, which is the praise, reverence, and service of God. Everything is made to praise, reverence, and serve God. This is St. Ignatius again. And so when, when a human converts and turns back towards the Lord and I begin to put my focus and you begin to put your focus on how can I best serve God? Nature change, everything changes. Everything is turned back towards its proper ordering. So, so our goal in this life is really as we turn to the Lord and make him the focal point of our lives, how can I best praise, reverence, and serve God? All of nature begins to find its proper ordering again which is to the praise, reverence, and service of God. So it's not so much our spiritual life is about seeing God in all things as drawing all things into God, getting it back into its proper ordering. But that starts with humans. How do we reorder ourselves, for starters, towards the praise, reverence, and service of God? Last few thoughts. The mother who has borne him and carries him now in her arms carries the child, capital C, <laughs> whom her body formed, and carries also her God in whom she believes, who has formed and given her whole faith to her. This is the one who formed her, the one she's carrying. It's a beautiful image for you and me. What are the how does the word of God speak to me? How do I carry that word of God within me? How has that, that word of God formed me? And I adore the word of God working within me. This beautiful interplay here of allowing herself to be formed by the word of God, allowing herself to surrender this, this God who has created her and given her his faith and given her his love she, she contemplates this love of the Father given her in this child, and she wants nothing more than to surrender this child back to the Father constantly and to live within that same dynamic of surrender. Thus, she becomes the mother of us all, showing us how to be a true mother. And Jesus will say elsewhere in Scripture, doing the will of God is to become brother, sister, and mother. To me, we're called to become mother of the word also. We men too, by the way. <laughs> There's nothing too particular here that's uh, related to the sexes that we men are not called to, to take in the same way. In front of God, we are all actively receptive. God is always taking the initiative in our regard. We are the ones called to bear forth the word of God. So opening out of herself, this giving of herself is the true mystery of Christmas. The surrendering of what's most precious to her and receiving it back as gift, as God wishes. As the mother became fruitful to receive the son, 
so she will now on be fruitful in the Son to become mother of us all. The future fruitfulness will be double, that of the Son in the mother and that of the mother in the Son. I invite you then, as I come to a conclusion here, that to ponder and to ask the Blessed Mother, what is it in my life that I'm called to custode, to protect, and to surrender? What, am I, what is the Word of God? How does the Word of God speak to me? How do I allow my faith to be a precious gift? See, faith is a theological virtue given us by God, infused. How do I allow my faith, my hope, my charity, to be received as a gift, to be nourished as a gift, and to be surrendered over to others. How am I called to have that kind of expectation of Mary that's, the, that's godly expectation, not just Father Anthony's expectation, but where is the word of God speaking deeply within me? How do I protect that? When you, when you notice something touching you deeply and you notice that resonance, take care of that, protect that. Let everything about you nourish that that new life within you, the Word of God. And let us turn and make a final prayer to our Blessed Mother. We will pray the memorari. Remember, O most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known that anyone who fled to thy protection, implored thy help, or sought thy intercession, was left unaided. Inspired by this confidence, I fly unto thee, O Virgin of virgins, my mother. To thee do I come, before thee I stand, sinful and sorrowful. O Mother of the Word incarnate, despise not my petitions, but in thy mercy hear and answer me. The Lord be with you. The Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go in peace, custoding the Word of God.